and Instagram is about uh, a short burst of, in- of inspiration. Effectively, that's what you want in your photo. Either that short burst of inspiration or something that gets you talking and, and commenting. Business of Architecture UK, episode nine. Hello and welcome, Architect Nation. This is the podcast for architects where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running an impactful and profitable design practice. And today I'm talking with Adam Nathaniel Furman, who many of you may know, as you might follow him already on Instagram. He's become a sensation on that platform with around 20,000 followers. Um, He's created this kind of visual library of postmodern gems and all these kinds of architectural treasures that have just become quite a compelling feed and really been a champion for this kind of architecture. Um, Adam himself is a designer. He's worked for Terry Farrell. He's worked for OMA. He's worked for Ron Arad, Ash Ash Sackler. Um, And he's also currently teaching at Central St. Martins. And he's just released a book called Revisiting Postmodernism with Sir Terry Farrell. So in this interview we look at what makes a compelling instagram account and how you can turn these kind of social media followings into paid work so sit back and enjoy this interview with adam and i'm here with the inspiring adam nathaniel Furman. i said your name correctly absolutely brilliant (laughs) and i'm here in your amazing studio come apartment which is just filled with the most intense brilliant collection of architectural tomes and monographs and books and ceramics and ceramics <laughs> and just all sorts of incredible collectibles and some of you may know adam because you probably follow him on instagram and adam is quite an ins- you've got your fingers in so many different pies in lots of different things and i think what you're doing is really it's just unique and i think it's very like inspiring and refreshing to you know, what we were just talking about before we started recording, just hearing about your ideas on architecture, on being an architect. So I suppose that to start the conversation, I'd like how would how would you describe yourself? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> so I I can't call myself an architect because I'm not yeah. registered, but um, obviously I'm deeply embedded within architecture, and I studied architecture, I teach architecture, I have have taught it, I run a research group at the Architectural Association. Um, and I work on projects that can be described as architectural in every way. But um, I refer to myself as a designer just simply because I think it's it's a it's more of a catch-all. Yeah. It doesn't have a title, a legal title associated with it, and it it can encompass everything from the design of a mug. Obviously, I've got these mugs on sale at the moment at the Sony Museum to um, research to um, the design of buildings, and yep. facades. Um, so it's just because it's an all-encompassing catch-all phrase. Yeah. So I call myself designer. And so you've got lots of kind of you know. You know activities of like entrepreneurial activities from it just, just explain a, a few of the f- different things that you're that you're doing um and so, then i want to talk, talk to us about yeah. like your social media presence and how you kind of how you built that up um so in terms of my activities i um i currently teach i'm a i'm a tutor at central st martin's yep. architecture so that's a nice sort of grounding annually it sort of keeps me keeps me going to the office every week um, and being inspired by young young students, um, I also am a journalist. So I write for various publications, mm-hmm. which keeps my my brain ticking over. Um, I try, particularly on on that, to be a positive uh, reviewer. I like to share um, inspirational things rather yeah. than criticizing. Um, so I tend to accept commissions for projects that I know that I've got something to positive to say about it or to contribute to. To um, I also. Um, do quite a lot of research. Um, I think the side of that you see coming out on social media. So yeah. a lot of that research just sort of like ends up on Tumblr and in Instagram um, and people enjoy that very much. But that's also turning into concrete things like a book which I've got coming out for Reba called Revisiting Postmodernism which I've written with Sir Terry Farrell. Yeah. Uh, so that's coming out at the end of this month. Um, the research I mentioned a research group at the Architectural Association looks at colour as is a sort of active agent in architecture and urbanism. Yeah. And we've we've been running events and holding symposiums and publishing research texts for the past six years. So we've got like mm. quite an amazing archive online for that, um, as well as um, in my own practice, which is myself, and then I work with uh, freelance people on various projects. Yeah. I do installations. Just had gateways, which was a pretty 
successful installation at London Design Festival. Which and was absolutely amazing. Yeah, yeah it was. The public responded so well that Kings Cross asked to keep it for a few days actually Brilliant. after the event because um, sort of by that was a, general a, a agreement. Collaboration of Land of Ceramics was it or Turkish Ceramics? Turkish Ceramics. Yeah, they're, yeah. They're, their Twitter, their, their Twitter and Instagram handle is Land of Ceramics because someone else has Turkish Ceramics. Right. Yeah, it's the it's the it's the national body that represents the all Turkish ceramic manufacturers in the country in yep. Turkey. So they got, and that's the second biggest manufacturing country in the world for ceramics. So they right. got clout and they've got good good funding and they're really they've been really good good to work for. But I also do interiors. Yep. Um, I'd love to do more. So basically anything architectural. So currently I've got interiors projects. I think which someone of my age is quite common to yeah. start with. Um, and uh, as well as doing product design, um, and whatever, whatever comes my way. Really. Yeah. And it's all got your kind of unique stamp, like your sort of <laughs> expression. Yeah. Your I, colorful. I think some, that, that's been, that's been quite good. I, I was just talking to you before about the fact that I have worked for other offices for a very long time yeah. and on the side, I've done my own projects. And I think part of that was that. Um, it allowed me to be very selective in the projects that I chose mm. to accept or that I chose to go for. Yeah. Um, in the sense that rather than desperately needing work, because I had to sort of, you know, get money in. Yeah. I, I like living well. Um, <laughs> it was a matter of, does this client like what I do? Do they like my proposal? Um, well, um, or, or, you know, is it, is it a particular brief? I didn't want to do kitchen extensions. Um, is it a particular brief that I find really exciting where I feel like I can push the boundaries that's mm. of, of, a, of, of my aesthetic, which is going to be good for my portfolio? Yeah. So I can yeah. be really selective. So what, what that's allowed me is over the past eight years to build up a portfolio, which means nobody at all is ever going to come to me as a client yeah. expecting to get a John Pawson interior. You know, so it's actually now allowed me to get and, and work so, in. And so that was kind of developed as a result of you kind of work whilst you're working other practices yeah. that kind of always gave you the safety net so you could be be that selective. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah because I, I didn't need I didn't need it. Yeah. Practically speaking. And actually and I and I was very lucky that the practices all the practices that I worked in were like hugely supportive of, of me doing my own work. Not just me, also other people in the offices. So and it was also because I I've worked for kind of I think practitioners who are quite creative as well yeah. now and also when they were younger and they, they also had unusual parts so uh, for instance when I was working at Ron Arad there were <coughs> quite a few of us in the office who'd be actually almost actually everyone for instance on my <laughs> part of my side of the desk we were all doing our own projects and Ron was like super supportive of it so it was also being in an environment where everyone else was doing something similar yeah um, and we all and we were all doing the same thing in the sense of we were using our income to kind of you know kind of keep us happy yeah and then using our free time to keep us even happier creatively. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Brilliant. And and how have you how have you been using Instagram? So also that's a lot how how I've been kind of following your work was mm. kind of I saw this intense Instagram that had the most fascinating selection of images, and I was like, I got to talk to this guy. And then like you know, it, it's you've got like an Instagram following of you saying sixteen and a half thousand, mm -hmm. which is the kind of following that lots of architectural practices would absolutely like yes. kill for. Kill for <laughs> exactly. So many people want want to know. And it's How? actually, I mean, what I mean, what I'm particularly happy with is that it's, um, it's a very good group of people following. So yeah. I tend to get big bumps of people following because someone recommends it, and yeah. then most of them unfollow. So, and I retain only like, and it's mostly architects and designers with an open mind, rather than like people who want clickbait or just want kind of like large photos of repetitious facades that look pretty, yeah, and don't give them information. That's what I think. So I tend to. Because of the stuff I post and because there's so much of it, I tend to weed out non non committed uh, followers. <laughs> so I and so that I think that's that segues into how it's been really helpful for me in terms yeah. of my my work and getting commissions because it's a very I think I tend to get only really committed followers who are really passionate and that's led to um, pe the, the kinds of people following me who then get in contact because they actually want to do stuff. Yeah, but tell us a little bit how you started the Instagram account, how it began. How did it begin? I think someone joined for me because I, I was I, I was saying that um, I I'm I'm a s very slow adopter, but yeah. once I adopt something, then I sort of go a bit nuts. Um, so Facebook, my students joined me, like I gave them my details and they joined yeah. me, um, and obviously now I'm like totally all over it. Um, and I think Instagram, I think it was my brother or something. I'm not sure who joined who joined me 
into it, set up my account. And then I just very slowly started to feel my way through it. I remember for the first few months, like posting, I didn't understand what it was for. So I was like posting photos of a windowsill <laughs> that like looked terrible. But like, I thought that there's light and is it arty? Like, I don't know, like, am I meant to post arty stuff? Yeah, yeah. Um, and then like some railings and I had like zero followers for quite a long time. Um, and then I, I kind of cottoned on to the idea. And then I started to see, because I obviously followed a lot of people that I liked. Yeah. Um, and then I started to see what I enjoyed in other people's posts and learn from that. And, and the thing that I enjoyed the most was on the one hand, people sharing, uh, just, just in a very boring way, in like an architectural historical way, sharing buildings that they saw mm -hmm. in everyday life. Yeah. And they found out what it was. Yeah. And then they shared it. And there was a little bit of like, oh my God, did you know that this little building on this high street in Berkminster was by, uh, Richard Norman Shaw. Yeah. And it's yeah. just that little bit of joy that, mm. that happens. Or there was one account, or there is one account of, I can't remember his name, but he, he only posts photos. And I, I don't necessarily like accounts that only do one thing, but he only posts photos of blind windows. And it was just really <laughs> lovely. It was just really lovely to follow that. Um, and also. Yeah, there's, a, there's like a depth, isn't there, to, to, to those. That makes it more interesting. It's kind of like kind of geeky of obsession. Just, yeah. He just loves them. Yeah. And, it, and it's, and they're very interesting, actually. Yeah. Like, and he, has, he finds stories behind them. Um, and then the other thing I liked was I, I thought that you could only post your own photos. Right. But then I saw that actually other people started, I saw people posting the stuff that they'd scanned mm -hmm. or stuff that they found online. And I was like, oh, copyright? Yeah. And then actually, no, there's like basically no copyright issues on Instagram. You right. Like basically post anything. Um, it's just super, super lax. So I was like, oh, well. What are the copyright rules then on that? That it's they're just doesn't non-existent yeah it's uh, i mean effectively you can just you, i personally whenever i know where an image is from i i post the image source but very often it's like a, it's like a probably 15 million times removed from a tumblr yeah or um if it's from if i if i scan it from a book very often like i just you know kind of put it in occasionally i'll mention the magazine it's from but i, I very very often will leave it if i post in other areas that in non-social media, it's completely different. Yeah. So like I yeah. cite I, 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 the photographer and the copyright issues. But no, it's very, it's very lax. If it's from another Instagram account, obviously you just, you have to yeah. say where they're from and yeah, yeah. it's a, a repost. And if I, but it, it's effectively social media has different rules. Yeah. So I was like, oh, okay, well then I can actually just start posting things that uh, I like or that I come across. Yeah. Um, and so my research then started to just bleed into the, into the page and I started to post things from what I was looking at, um, what I was researching, things that I scanned, things that I came across on the internet and just posting them directly onto the, onto the account. Um, and that's where it kind of and clearly it was, took off. Yeah, it looks like it's become quite, quite an obs obsession. Like it's, yeah, well, and it's, it's epic. It's like it's really, really quite a fascinating thing to kind of engage with. And, and it was interesting... What, what do you think is the mistakes that lots of architects or designers or people do with their Instagram accounts that make them totally unstimulating? Because the thing is, I tend to not follow the unstimulating yeah. ones, so it's it's difficult to say. But I mean, from the from the kind of corporate, well, corporate, but like the kind of practices that I've seen who who post, um, I think the 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 ones if it's like a smaller office or a medium sized office, the only the ones that tend to really work are the ones where like perhaps the owner of the office it's like treated as their personal account yeah and there's like a lot of personal thought sharing of, of events uh visits to visits to site uh little snip tit, tit bits of like the creative process so it's very personal yeah and quite a lot of quantity mm. uh, the worst ones are where it's like instagram by committee you know and it's like we had the christmas party yay <laughs> and uh we just won uh, Architects Journal Interior Retrofit Award of the Year. Yay! <laughs> you know, and great. Yeah. And it's like once a week. It's kind um, of me-centric type of thing, but not actually showing anything. It's basically press releases, yeah. you know, effectively. And it's like, well, you know, we all get press releases in our email. Right? Mm. We don't really, you're not going to follow that on Instagram. Instagram's about uh, a short burst of, in of inspiration. Effectively, that's what you want yeah. from your photo. Either that short burst of inspiration or something that gets you talking. And, and commenting and yeah the office christmas party or your aj retrofit award is not going to is not going to win you any fans yeah at all yeah. um and i was just saying that um the bigger offices sometimes i, I think you mentioned Rochester stack harbor and i was talking about som yeah and boffville um 
they have more resourcing and perhaps the one who's the ones who actually allocate a staff member or a couple of staff members the responsibility of running the, the Instagram feed uh, who can really take ownership over it and who also have access to the archives and also yeah. have access to like current site visits and, and project photos. They can be great. Like yeah. SOMs is really enjoyable because you're getting like history, you're getting current stuff and they insert within that the corporate we just won the best award of the year for this. And, and then you don't mind so much because there's a lot of like kind of really interesting content yeah. that, that it's couched around. And it's really, it's really interesting as well because the con- pe- when we consume social media, we're in a certain mind space or we're kind of, we've consumed so much of it that we know what we're looking for and it tends to be something that's just authentic. Mm. And when it's not an authentic message, it doesn't, it just doesn't land. Yeah, we have like, we have like whiskers, no? Yeah, We're like yeah. super sensitive, like that's fake. Yeah, exactly. That's forced. Yeah, exactly. You know, that, that was generated by uh, an algorithm or like uh, a, poor, a poor comms person in an office who has no ability to be allowed to write for herself or himself. Yeah. And you're like, oh no, no, no. Yeah, not exa- gonna get that. exactly, and like, and we're and we're super sort of sensitive to that. And when 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 it's not when that authenticity is not there, you kind of like your attention is gone. Yeah, that's it. And the, and then the media, the, the the feed or the post becomes irrelevant and kind of like a well, away. people don't follow. Yeah, or they unfollow. So yeah, I mean, and particularly in architecture because our subject matter is not exactly dancing and singing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, in its own right, you know. So I think extra effort <laughs> needs to be made to try and engage. Yeah. And, on a personal and, level. And, and how, how have you grown it? Because I know that you're involved in lots of kind of advocacy and like campaigns like for, for post-modernism, modernism, post-modernism <laughs> yeah. and you're involved in like, you know, just starting new conversations that perhaps are sometimes unpopular in the sort of mainstream architectural... Yeah, they know. Norm- I mean, normally, I think normally that's possibly why I'm drawn to them because yeah. there are vacant spaces. Yeah. Right, because they're not popular. So that's why I tend to start these conversations. Yeah. And, that, and all of that has kind of helped you set up what is now your like would you call it a practice or would you call it just your way of practicing well, it's my it's my practice but yeah. the practice is me and yeah and i work with and then i collaborate with people on individual projects but i am an individual operator yeah um i think um so i think instagram is like where effectively like there's lots of conversations that i'm having we are having because it's like it's all sort of lots of people um and instagram is just effectively where this all comes together so there's like the visual material from various things i'm looking at researching and talking about yeah tend to come together and get posted on the instagram yeah. so it's sort of like you get it's the compost heap of it will come together um but these conversations that i've set up so postmodernism, which was initially just a fight <laughs> and then turned into a conversation later on um the, a really important part of that has been uh the facebook group postmodern society which um has now just sort of exploded into this sort of like peep thing with fifteen thousand people and it's not as interesting as it was before where there were just like a thousand people who are having really intense conversations of, of a lot of depth. And still now there's like key, there's key members who are amazing. Yeah. A lot of them are not architects. It's actually really, really interesting uh, how, how non-architects who have incredible knowledge about architecture have been really, yeah. really um, key to pushing the conversation forward. Um, so that's, that, that was very helpful. But then also a lot of advocacy in the press. So I wrote a lot of articles initially being supported by very few publications because nobody mm. wanted to write about postmodernism unless it was critical. Um, and uh, BD was actually, I think, the first one who were really helpful in responding in terms of trying to campaign to save buildings. So um, I think the, the, original, the reason I sort of like really came out and started advocating was because uh, they started demolishing some really good postmodern architecture, uh, particularly Terry Farrell's. And, um, you know, my point was, is like, we really don't have very much good postmodern architecture in this country. It's not like the United States where they're just awash with it. Like yeah, we have yeah. like, eight good buildings mm. hardly any it's not like brutalism where there's great architecture everywhere yeah. because the state was building so much of it so i was horrified by the by the fact that we were losing some of them so i just went full out advocate advocating um but you know so through legal channels also because i i was i tried to list uh landmark house mm. the midland bank building failed but then there was an uproar about the language that was used by historic england for not supporting it and then so then when we went i went and then i i lodged an application to mm. list common ching which was being defaced uh and then historic england kind of had to rally behind us um and um got that to be the first postmodern building ever listed in the uk and so that was a big campaign which went really well and that was hand in hand with all the writing in magazines and hand in hand also with the postmodern society on yeah. facebook which was really helping develop ways to counteract arguments that other people were putting forward for like why should we demolish these buildings why we should hate them um twitter was more like effectively trying to emolliate 
uh, sort of calm down the critics who refuse to allow uh, this kind of architecture or any architecture in this period to have any airspace yeah. or to be respected in any way or to be taken seriously in any way. And that, that, that worked quite well. I mean, it never, it never reached a point where there was agreement at all, but it reached a point where there was a space that was allowed for these things to be considered not evil. Um, <laughs> and Instagram, Instagram initially was just this side thing. Yeah. It's just like, oh, it's just like nice images. And I started posting. And then I was like, my God, I started to get loads of followers. Yeah. Um, and then I started getting messages about like potential work and stuff. So Instagram actually in, in many ways has started to become more of a, a much broader um, ish, um, sort of way of directing taste. Yeah. So modifying broader taste issues. So the other, the other uh, sort of areas, media areas, have been, I guess, to, to do with changing the debate. Yeah. Discussion, discursive, textual, to do with conversations. Um, Instagram has literally been about acquainting people with the qualities of a particular way of designing or particular ways, because it's not only postmodernism. I've also been trying to advocate for color in architecture. Yeah. Also been trying to advocate for classicism yep. and stealing it out of the hands of the, tr the trad architects. Yeah. And trying to show that it's a creative thing that can still be used as just as relevant. And as still is applicable and it's got relevance. And it's just yeah. as relevant as classical architecture. It's yeah. just, it's been stolen by the right wing. Yeah. Um, and also Edwardian architecture. So there's kind of quite a lot of, various things that have been coming together on the Instagram feed. And, and it's been really nice to see how people from the beginning, like no likes on Edwardian buildings, no likes on uh, uh, sort of kind of postmodern architecture. Um, and then now loads. And, you know, it's because simply once people start seeing many of something, it's like, I think sometimes, you know, people, you know, come to a new city and all the buildings look the same. So, so my, my boyfriend, when he first came to London, he was like, everything, everything looks the same. <laughs> I'm like, really? Where's he, where's he from? Milan. I Milan. was like, oh, <laughs> Milan looks the well, same. Okay, it all right. looked the same to me in Milan, though. When I went there, and it's like, uh, and, you know, I think London is a city of great architectural diversity, but then, yeah. you know, it's because he wasn't, it, he's new to it. And then the more he's lived here, now he's like, oh, it's the most diverse, it's wonderful, there's so many different yeah. architectures, I wish we had this in Milan. And it's simply a matter of becoming acquainted with a context or, or a way of designing that yeah. you then start to differentiate between all the small variations, right? And then it becomes a whole world. Whereas if from the outside you're only acquainted with brutalism or like neo-chipperfield minimalism, right? You look at anything perma, anything that has color, anything that's sort of complex, anything that uses collage, you're just like, ugh, perma. Yeah. You know, whereas actually there's an entire giant universe within that, that once you start seeing many of them on a feed, for instance, yeah, by feed, yeah. you start differentiating between them and suddenly London becomes full of many different buildings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you are, you're essentially you're educating. It's like That's it's all visually educating. It's, it's like a yeah, visually yeah. education resource. Which but it is shows kind of how, you know, there's people like, who hilariously think that taste is not acquired. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because I've seen people's taste change. I mean, they constantly change. My taste change. Uh, I'm just very aware. So like, I, I don't, shit on the things I don't like because I'm aware that my dislike unless it's based on kind of practical operational functional issues is likely to change in yeah. the future so I'm kind of I'm kind of reflexively aware that that like my dislike is not objective yeah yeah to a certain degree um and uh, so this is separate to issues of quality of construction relationship to city is aesthetic um and so it's really nice to see how you can shift people's tastes mm. and that people start to become aware that tastes are changeable yeah um and i can tell people who say no taste is objective this is just bad this is just bad taste this is just awful which yeah. i still get all the time even from like really serious academics it's hilarious yeah. you know they're like they're still convinced that their aesthetic tastes are like somehow objective that this very much absolutely objectively proves yeah. <laughs> that taste is acquired, modifiable, constantly changeable based upon social circumstances, based upon what you see and what you're acquainted with. Mm. That's it. That's so it's been fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, and it, and it is. It's absolutely, because that is like, you know, in, in that, that's how you've kind of created this kind of dialogue and an audience, which in turn, how, how have people been approaching you for work then? How is it kind of... DMing. How, how, long, how long did it take for you to sort of for these, for the, for this conversation and your passions to turn into like, to, into projects, and how and what's the sort of what's the future for your practice? How do you how do you in, envision it? Because um, it, it was interesting you were saying earlier as well about like it's you know, and I don't hear architects talk about this very often. Is like designing a practice which suits their lifestyle. Yeah, I'm surprised that you haven't heard that. Yeah, 
Well, that's, I mean, that's the key to having a. Well, no, t- totally, totally, totally. <laughs> and I, and, you know, and I hear it in the sort of other circles a lot, like entrepreneurial circles. Yeah. People when they're starting up the business, tech, there's a lot of discussion at the moment about how to balance your yeah a good life with actually yeah exactly like being a lifestyle entrepreneur. Yeah. You're designing a business because you want it like hands free. It's automated. It's digital. It's kind of online. You can live, work wherever you want. Yeah. Whereas in architectural circles, sometimes we get a bit kind of, you know, we only think there's one way of running a practice. Yeah, I was talking to someone the other day. I was like, the model of, there's many models of practice, but was, just, we, were brought up, we were just brought up at the, at the AA with a particular model uh, of practice, which was the kind of Zaha Farshid Musavi yeah. model, which was um, you kill yourself for your job. Like, yeah. you don't sleep for a year. <laughs> and your, your interns have to go to psychologists after after they finish the project <laughs> and uh you know you you divorce because you can't have a normal family and uh it's it's simply not sustainable in the sense of why do it because you you know why even design something that requires that if it's going to kill your life and mean that you won't be able to design more in the future yeah um and I think there's very much amongst, I mean, I hopefully amongst my generation, very much with, with me, yeah. a desire to factor that lifestyle aspect into both the designs that I do mm. and the way that I, the, the, the commissions that I accept and the way that I work day to day. Yeah. That, that, that's not what I do. That like I manage to produce things that I'm happy with, but also I have a lifestyle which allows me to have uh, time free. Yeah. Uh, uh, time with my partner. Yeah. Time with my family. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, uh, and, and that I don't, you know, end up an emotional wreck. Yeah. Or dying at 55. Exactly. And as, <laughs> and as you say, when that balance is present, then the work is better. Like, no, I'm not sure. I, no, I, I, I wouldn't I, say I, that. No, I wouldn't say that. No, because I, I absolutely, no, no. I think it, it just ma- it makes for nicer, it makes for better offices, it makes yeah. for better human beings. Uh, but no, I mean, Zaha's. But a foreign office's building is brilliant. Absolutely. It's yeah. just, my God. Yeah, yeah. You know, like I remember when I went to see an exhibition at the ICA, that place that doesn't really do very much anymore. But <laughs> back in 2002 or three or something, there was the exhibition on the Yokohama Ferry Terminal building. Yeah. Um, incredible project. Have you, I don't know if you've visited it. I've never visited it. But absolutely brilliant. It's one of, those, um, one of those projects that is often like in somebody's studio in the architecture school always open yeah. on that page or some, you're like copying details off it. Un- yeah, unfortunately it's like non-reproducible. Again, a project that like killed them. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. And there was the exhibition on it and they, they proudly, because again, there was this sort of culture when I was growing up in architecture of like showing off how much work. Yeah. Right? It's not, there were like I think it was 1,500 pages of drawings and they mm. just had this stack I mean it was a mountain of drawings mm. <coughs> as if that was quality yeah you know it's like they didn't even show it's like you, you walked in you didn't see the building you saw this stack of drawings and it was kind of interesting it's like the building's brilliant it doesn't, doesn't need that you know and actually I as far as I'm concerned great art should look effortless yeah right yeah. it's not it's, it's like it's like a jewel yeah or a watch that because the design is shit, it has to show off, which Yokohama is not shit, but it's just in principle, right? These luxury products that have to show off the amount of work, like this insanely overly ornate amount of craft that goes into like the back of the watch yeah. that's left clear so that you can see all of the hours that you're paying for. Mm. So it's a quantitative thing rather than something about the quality of the design. Yeah. And like, for instance, that project didn't need that. You yeah. Know? It was a brilliant design. So... You know, like for instance, in my work, it's actually like it's the opposite. It's a matter of how little drawing can I do to make something really good. Yeah. Can I Photoshop a scribble in conversation with a contractor instead of producing a whole new set of drawings? You know, it, that, that's that's effectively yeah, like just it's, 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 yeah. It. It's much more like actually. Can I, I FaceTime with the with the contractor? Yeah, it's much more about the communication. Um, yeah, and getting the idea expressed. Yeah, and then and getting not it beautiful or either beautiful construction drawings or drawings that are just like quantitatively like totally unnecessary it just screams of uh, potentially screams of a kind of inefficiency that could be Mm. possibly avoided and similarly at oma there was a culture of you couldn't leave like the the less you slept it was a kind of very macho culture of the 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 less you slept the cooler you were yeah yeah you know so i've been in offices in the past where and it's not the officer's fault it's just it's just a kind of communal culture that had developed over the years sort of people would be sitting at eight o'clock twiddling their thumbs and like clicking around on the internet because they've just felt that they had to be in the office mm. and they'd like stay until 10 for no reason. And in OMA, like it was the same thing. Like I first day I was kept until 4am 
Uh, I was kept until 4 a.m. in the office, and it wasn't really because any work needed to be done. It was just this sort of culture of producing huge quantities of work. Yeah, somehow, yeah. Because you just had to do it, and it was you know, eight, 98% of what, what I did there didn't turn into anything. And again, it's not a, it's not a critique of them. It's just, I think there's it's a, a genera- generational shift, yeah. possibly, that's just like, that was great, and then amazing stuff came out of it, but possibly... Uh, again, like in tech, I think there's been a sh- similar shift. So what, so what do you think is the sort of shift for young architects, people coming out of university? Um, what would you advise or what kind of like guidance would you suggest like, to break away from that kind of culture or for like setting well, up practices think, or for like... Or how, do you, how do you see the, the future of the profession kind of I think there's been a really, changing? There's been a really nice shift generally. So like I think you know, this, this, my attitude is part of a much broader chain there's you know do you remember that great campaign that was led by i think i mean numerous people but i think bd and aj and lots of independent uh, uh practitioners against unpaid internships oh yeah yeah so and that you know i think we've forgotten about that debate but it was it worked really well mm. it was amazing and and i think there's this notion that there, well, there's an understanding that for first of all on on that on that side you're locking people out on lower incomes because, like, work is work, and you can't effectively subsidize offices by through the parents of interns, which is what it was happening. And on, and on <laughs> well, I mean, it was. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, yeah. that's, that, that was the business model. I mean, that's I, I've I've heard there's you know still star architect offices around the world that still operate in that way, but it's become so ethically unpalatable mm. in Britain. It doesn't. I think, as far as I'm aware, it really doesn't happen here anymore. Yeah. From places um, where, like in Japan, it's much more, it's a commonplace thing for it to... Yeah, you know, I mean, Japan is a cultural thing. It's yeah. Like it's, it's almost all offices there. Yeah. But I think, I think big does it. But I, and someone, someone told me the other day that, I, I don't want to say names because it's just, yeah, yeah. that's just hearsay. Uh, whereas in Japan, I know it's a cultural thing generally. Um, but I know that here it's not, it's changed massively. And I saw that, for instance, when I was working in Farrell's, like it's, you know, they literally treat their part ones and their interns as employees. Yeah. Fully. Um, and I mean, I don't want to go into details, but it's, it's great there. And I know that it's the same in most other major offices now and even a lot of medium-sized and smaller offices. So on the one hand, there's that, which is fantastic, but also there's an issue of working culture which has changed. So from my experience of the offices I've come across, I'm not sure what it's like in small design offices mm. like, I don't know, 6A or Cruises Engine. I don't, I don't know how they are now. But in a lot of uh, medium-sized practices, um, the, the, the kind of extreme late-night culture is really reduced. And I think there is an understanding, for instance, that like uh, a lot of younger people need to have a life, right? And they, they, there isn't this need for them to sort of sleep under the desk and stuff. So the le- you know, all nighters do happen. Yeah. We, it's just because our profession, our profession is inherently inefficient, right? We're creatives <laughs> fundamentally, although nobody likes to admit that. So there are always going to be terrible late nights where decisions have been made late. We've gone through fifteen options, and that's fine. But it's all the stuff in between, and, and I think that that's very much reduced, as far as I've understood. Um, and so, I mean, talking to my students in St. Martin's, uh, you know, now they're kind of going out looking for uh, offices, um, I really do uh, ask them or, or suggest that they check, speak to other people who've worked in an office before and ask about office culture, because I think more, than, mm. more important than the, the design an office produces is the office culture of how they treat mm. their staff. Yeah. Um, how they deal with responsibility, yeah, um, and what and, and sort of just what the environment is like on a human level. Yeah. And again, this is so. I think about these things for me myself when I'm working by myself now and what projects I take on. But I'm also very highly advising my students to to uh, send their antennas out beforehand so that they don't end up in situations that will make them hate architecture and be depressed, which yeah. happens. I mean, yeah, it's your, yeah. you spend all your you spend all your hours in that place. Yeah, no, and that's it's 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 a it's a concerning trend that it, that ha- that happens, and it's kind of like how to mitigate against it and have people empowered in their choices and where they want to go and how they want to kind of express themselves in the world of of architecture yeah i mean going you know offices i think offices are so much better than than they were before which is great um but like 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 you say i think um do you, do you, do you i'm just gonna say do you, do you find a lot of your students are actually um they're quite sort of entrepreneurially minded or they're kind of they're kind of they realize at university that there's lots of other ways that they could make a living from architecture or that like they're engaged in different things online and they're you know selling drawings for example like i mean i've seen a lot of students who are kind of doing things like that where they start actually monetizing projects from early on is that something that's kind of like a popular trend or is it um 
well, I mean, I teach in one university. Yeah. Well, I'm involved in the not, I'm kind of involved in the A because of the research cluster. I think you know students are way more business savvy than they were before. Which yeah. Is, which is great. Um, but I think the majority is still very much, uh, which is good because the professionalism is, you know, they, they want to go and they want to leave, leave, go to an office, get a placement, uh, do their part three, um, which is great. I teach intermediate, so then they'll, they'll do their part, part one placement and come back and do part two and then do part three. But um, I think sort of broadly, broadly speaking, most people still want to go down that route. But I think there are a few very, very keyed up students. And it should never be more than that because obviously the, the majority of the profession needs to go and work as, as kind of architects, project architects. Um, but there are sort of the 10% who are through social media, because before it was much more difficult to, to see people who were doing things differently, through social media, very aware that there's other models that they can follow. But I, it's difficult to say models because there's no clear track. So I was talking to one particular student who I adore um, <laughs> <laughs> on Tuesday. Um, and, you know, she was... You know, um, you know, saying, "Oh, you know, is your your route something I can follow down?" I was just explaining to her. I think, look, study what I've done, study what other people have done mm. who have gone down different routes mm -hmm. and different paths. But because she's a sort of very creative person, has a like most creative people has an unusual particular mix of things she's interested in. They're yeah, never the yeah. same, right? Yeah, yeah. So I'm like, don't copy it, but be aware that maybe you can pick cherry prick some of the things that some of us have done. So, for instance, I've my career was very helped um, by uh, having the Design Museum residency. Yeah. Hugely helped. I mean, it's like that's, that sort of helped kick everything off. Uh, the British School at Rome, Rome Prize. Yeah. Um, so there's these, there are these things that have along the way given you kicks. Um, and other people I know have similarly had log, uh, kind of had bursaries or won prizes uh, that have really helped them go down mm. the particular route they wanted. So I was telling her, like, research those look for bursaries, mm. look what other people have done and find the ones that are relevant for you. And then once you get one or two of those and you start going off in your own direction, you'll find your own journey. Your own footing, yeah. Um, but yeah, I think there's about 10% of students that through social media are aware that there's that architecture is not just grumpy old men in, you know, on the part three panel yeah, telling you your crap um, and telling Zaha she's not an architect. Um, <laughs> it's it, it's possibly many other things, yeah. um, and it's quite it's quite interesting. And it would be nice to see the profession embrace that, which it doesn't, yeah, yet. And you you were saying actually you made an interesting point about how you can see the profession going in the UK, either one of one of two ways. Yeah, I mean it is, it's a debate that's happening in the yeah. at the moment. It's been happening for the past like four years, but. Um, yeah, I mean, on, on the one hand, it can retrench and it can go back towards the, the, the way it is in most other countries, which is a sort of professionally protected title situation, which is yeah. highly controlled, where the practice is pr protected as well as the title, because there's obviously been this very weird situation where the title is protected, but not the practic practicing of the profession. Um, or uh, we can sort of increase the Venn diagrams of the, what's included within the understanding of the architectural profession and start to start to embrace people like myself. There's a mm. lot of us who are doing unusual mixes uh, of work within their career, but that all falls under the remit of something that is considered architecture yeah. role. Yes. Whether it's architectural yeah. discourse, architectural production, whether it's interior design, but kind of people who have come from architecture and branched out slightly. That it, I think if they increase what is considered architect... I think then they take ownership over the new directions in which the new sort of diffuse directions in which the, mm -hmm. the practice of building and making is going. And I have a feeling, I personally think that if that was codified, mm. that would be a hugely empowering thing for the RIBA, for instance. But How do you mean? A, a hugely empowering in the sense that it starts to represent a demographic or a group that is growing in prominence and power and relevance economically. Yeah rather than one that's absolutely shrinking, disappearing, unable to find its place, even within like really standard construction projects and you know, um, design groups. Like, you know, the architects got a massive sense of identity crisis. Yeah. Um, so I think there's, you know, it's not throwing out those roles of the architect, the traditional roles, but like adding new ones. Yeah, just and, expanding what it is. That and defining is. what those are and how they, how they relate to each other. And I think that would empower the ROBA because the, that part of the profession is growing so much. Yeah.
Yeah. So I think it would be very, very good for everyone. Yeah. And there is, and I know that there's discussion about this. They're talking about affiliate memberships and all kinds of things, but it would just... You know, it would further it along. Yeah. yeah it, would re- it would be really nice if they kind of actively pursued that, in, that broadening of the understanding of the profession. Brilliant. And they don't have to necessarily use the title. Like the title can stay, but it's like who who's part of the, who's part of the group. Yeah, yeah. No, and it sh- and it shows like it, it puts architects. It does it. It will do a lot of value for the title architect, knowing that it's kind of much more multifaceted and engaged with lots of different areas and disciplines. Yeah, I mean it, the the title. I, I'm not necessarily mean the title. The title doesn't have to broaden, but it's like these affiliations yeah. could be really good for the title yeah, of architect. Yeah. And it's you know yeah, it's like having exactly. it's like having backup. Right, you're not alone. Yeah, totally. <laughs> The whole, look, we got a quarter of the creative industries are part of our Ken, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it could be, I think it could be exciting and really positive. And I, I see there's so many practitioners I see who are like this. Um, and I think there is a big, but I think, you know, the core of the industry, understandably, mm. you know, like taxi drivers, they want to protect their, uh, their economic, um, area. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, for instance, you see Heatherwick, right? The way that he's being, He's obviously obviously being attacked now because of the garden garden bridge catastrophe, but um, even before that, people were just desperately waiting to tear him down. Desperately, I mean, he's just like they were just literally like chihuahuas waiting for yeah. like, someone to walk past so they could just attack them. Um, and you know, you can just see the glee with which the architectural profession has piled in on just tearing his reputation apart because he's an outsider. Mm. He's an affiliate person who yeah. works in architecture, but you know he's done wonders for yeah, yeah, totally. the way that British architecture, and I say architecture, is seen by the rest of the world. Yeah. So, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, I totally, totally, totally agree. Just broadening, broadening the, the horizon and sort of having a more all-encompassing. Yeah. Thank you so much okay. for talking to me. It's been absolutely fascinating. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. And Thank you. Me. Thank you. <laughs> Bye-bye. So that is a wrap. Thank you for listening. The views expressed on this show by my guest do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.